of Regis Kuczynski Paquette. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you today. This evening, we are on the first part of part two. And on the first session of part two, we are under the topic of the COVID-19 pandemic, big tech, privatization, surveillance, AI, and rush for data. Before we begin, I would like to start by saying thank you for joining us. I know you could be spending your two hours in any way you like, and it's amazing that you've chosen to join us with us. Um, I'm next gonna move on to the land acknowledgement, and then we're going to go through moments of recognition of uh, silence and recognition for the struggles of black folks, not just here in Toronto, but in the US and around the world. And finally, I'll introduce our moderator for this evening. So first, to the land acknowledgement. We like to start by acknowledging the land on which we are gathered today and by acknowledging the caretakers of this land. This is the land of the treaty, treaty territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit and the ancestral and traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe Chippewa, and Huron-Wendat nations. As we think through relationships, it is important that we also acknowledge Canada's settler colonial history, present, past, and that we renegotiate our relationships to the Indigenous peoples of this land. I would now like to recognize um, that it is the decade of people of African descent. And in relation to that, I'd like to recognize um, the recent passing of Regis Kurczynski Paquette, who died in the presence of police, like so many folks, whose family call for support and it ends tragically. And so our hearts go out for her family, her friends, her community, and Black people throughout Canada. This is not the first time. We hope it will be the last. But we stand in solidarity with you, and I'd like to take that moment of silence now. Our second moment of silence is in recognition to the many, many Black frontline workers. Those are living able-bodied, those who are living in a disabled body. Um, but for everybody that gets up and goes out, um, a few months ago, many of you were not considered essential workers, but you keep doing what you do anyways. And unfortunately, many of you have been exposed to COVID-19 um, and continue to be exposed. And we are deeply aggrieved. We stand with you in solidarity. And in this moment of silence, we take it for those who are exposed and who are worried. We, we take this moment of silence and recognition of support workers, frontline workers, nurses, all of the folks that are out there, delivery drivers, seen and unseen, sung and unsung. We'd like to say thank you. And for those who have passed on and to your families, we're deeply sorry. And we take this moment of silence in solidarity with you. And this final moment of silence is in recognition of our brothers and sisters south of the border in the US who continue to press forward as do we. And we stand in solidarity with them, not just in Minneapolis, but across the United States. And we know as black people across the world that we constantly struggle, not because we were born to struggle, but because some folks have decided that our containers are more important than anything else and that we are not deserving of our life to be in complete peace, unbothered and unthreatened. And so in this moment, we stand in solidarity with Minneapolis, but with black folks around the world who continue to resist persecution and oppression and to stand up for us right and just, not just for ourselves, because the world continues to benefit from our freedom struggles. And in this moment, we take this silence. And finally, this evening's conversation is going to be facilitated by Ronaldo Walcott. Myself and Naomi will be in conversation. And so, Ronaldo, would you like to join us? Thank you, Lana. Um, I look forward to this conversation very much. Um, what I want to do first is to introduce both of you. Um, I will be somewhat informal and brief. But first, um, Lana James is a PhD student in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto, who is researching um, AI, machine learning, respiratory, respiratory um, 
questions of respiratory illness and race in relationship to big data. Lana is also the organizer of this, of what has been this really quite amazing series of conversations over the last two weeks. And I think there are a couple more conversations to come. Um, Naomi Klein, as many of you who are joining us know, is a world renowned journalist, author, filmmaker, and um, a really important voice for um, a progressive future, um, a future where we can all find ourselves and our, and our full lives um, made available to us. Um, in particular, I think one of the things that we're going to talk a, a lot about or call on Naomi a lot about tonight is um, a recent piece of hers that appeared in The Intercept. So I'm not gonna go on too much about their biographies um, because I think you, you know them fairly well. Okay, um, I'm getting some kind of message that people can't see. <laughs> um, I apologize. Maybe that's better? Okay. Um, yes. So I think we should probably jump right into it. This is going to be a conversation that takes up questions of big data, technology, AI, machine learning, and questions of the new screen economy as Naomi has recently coined that term. And so, but in keeping with the, with the, other, um, the other conversations, I want to begin with a conversation that has been asked of all of the, um, all of the, the, the um, black speakers. And that conversation, and that question has been, are we all asking the same thing where race-based data is concerned. Lana, we'll begin with you. I think that where it comes to race-based data, um, we're definitely not all talking about the same thing. I think that's been clear with other discussants. Um, and part of the opportunity for this uh, symposium was to provide a space for folks to share their different perceptions and conceptions of race-based data. And so on my end, um, we can't be talking about the same thing because of the needs of different populations. There are tensions of class. There are tensions of um, docu being documented and documented. Um, there are tensions about like, where do you live? Because um, I know a number of folks who are very concerned. Um, while they wanted the justice, um, they didn't quite understand why it had to come through race-based data, especially for those that are constantly being carded and living in communities and neighborhoods where um, there's a heavy surveillance and heavy police presence. And so race-based data is not an ask that we all share um, without any kinds of caveats or pre-qualifications. So I definitely um, would say that we are not asking for the same thing. I have not heard us asking for the same thing. Um, and I think it's very um, contentious and concerning when a ask in the era of technology is not pre-qualified um, because that request for race-based race data sits in the midst of a data economy and a province where we have very weak data laws um, and almost no protection um, in regards to what most people imagine their protection is. Thank you, Lana. Um, maybe we can turn to Naomi. One of the things that really jumped out for me in your in in your new piece, and I should I should add that this piece was also republished in the Guardian, in case people hear us talking about it and they say, "Oh, that sounds like something I read somewhere else." Um, one of the things that jumped out for me in in that piece was the section where you began to talk about China and health. And I'm wondering if you've had any chance to go back and reflect on that, or if you can share with us some of the deep dive of the work that you did um, that's, that's embedded in that paragraph, because it was quite striking, um, the, 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 the information that you share on, on AI and health in, in China. Yeah, sure. And I just um, want to say how pleased I am to be with both of you and grateful to everybody who's joining us and, and just really honored to be part of this conversation. Um, I am, I'm not in Canada at the moment. I've been living in the US um, 
for the past couple of years. So I'm, a, I'm in New York state at the moment and, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been a, it's been a pretty heavy time. Um, and, and, and definitely felt very homesick. Um, and so really, really great for me to be part of this conversation with, with friends from Toronto. Um, and, and yeah, um, as Lana said, this, our, this is a moment where it's it's hard to just focus on anything other than what is happening in the streets and and um, and just so keenly aware as the as as uh, oh it's 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 uh, ten minutes it's past curfew in New York um, and 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 as we talk um, you know there's so many people um, particularly black people uh, who are just at tremendous risk from these paramilitary police. Um, so just wanted to say that. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and just to sort of zoom out a little bit, Ronaldo, um, I was just thinking as we were getting ready that, the, that I, first, I first met um, Lana at an event that you organized for Peter Hudson's um, book launch um, at, at U of T. Um, and we, and after that, um, heard from Lana about a really dramatic case of the shock doctrine or what I've called the shock doctrine of the use of crises to push through very radical um, uh, pro-corporate policies that further enrich elites at the expense of the poor. Um, at the expense of the already disenfranchised. Um, and Lana told me this story that I had heard nothing about, which was what was happening in Barbuda at that very moment. Um, it was uh, not long after Hurricane Irma um, had, uh, had, had, had devastated the island. It had experienced a 100% um, evacuation. Um, and I'd heard about all of that, but what I didn't know was that in the aftermath, <clears throat> there was this huge land grab going on um, that Hollywood mogul Robert De Niro was at the center of it. He had a hotel project um, uh, in Bar Barbuda and was part of this push to use the, um, the devastation of the hurricane <clears throat> to overturn these um, the, these these land laws in Barbuda that allowed for collective ownership and prevented um, private players um, from coming in and 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 buying up the island and turning the whole thing into a resort, and the 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 shock of the hurricane and people's the fact that people weren't able to defend themselves um, because they were physically not there, were not able to defend their land was being used in this really flagrant attack of, 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 of the shock doctrine. And I mention this because I think what is going on with tech um, and this discussion around uh, this really critical conversation about, um, about tech and, and, and COVID is a kind of land grab. And that's a phrase that um, Meredith Whitaker at AI Now um, a, a, at NYU has used to describe what companies like Google and Amazon are doing right now um, in using COVID. And now, not, not, now we've got a dual shock that, that they're using, right? They're using um, COVID and the fact that um, we are, um, <laughs> rightly afraid of certain social uh, social interactions um, that we engaged in before. We're worried about crowds. We're worried about spaces um, that uh, you know. We're worried about touch. You know, we're worried. We're worried. We we we're, we are, and and that is being used to um, to push a pre existing agenda, right? A pre existing agenda around. You mentioned health around telehealth and the China example, this is something that comes from a document that was um, accessed through freedom of information um, by a digital rights group uh, called Epic that FOIA'd um, presentations made by a body that is chaired by Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google. He's still 
um, a advisor to Google. He still owns um, billions in Google shares. Um, and he has left Google and now lobbies the US government full time to um, uh, you know, just get this kind of wish list that is really about um, about doing a whole lot of things that are that that you're able to do in China because there aren't the same democratic protections, there aren't the same human rights protections, there aren't the same privacy protections. Um, and you know, Google has been basically pissed off ever since they weren't able to go into China because of outside pressure and pressure from their workers. Um, to not collaborate with the Chinese surveillance state. So, so, so Google didn't go into China and lost access to that market and is now looking at what China has been able to do that Google hasn't been able to do. Things like smart cities, right? And this is super relevant to people in Canada. Um, you know, uh, this presentation that was accessed talked about how, um, you know, there are multiple smart cities with, um, uh, with listening capacity on uh, lamp poles and and all of the things that people were so concerned about um, about about sidewalk labs in Toronto, right? Uh, and particularly the way it would impact racialized communities, particularly Black and Indigenous people, um, who really led the pushback, right? But you look at these presentations and they're saying, look, in China they're already doing this, and the whole thing is framed as a uh, tech arms race. And the, it's, it's, it's all about the U.S. is losing ground to China. China is racing ahead because they don't have the pushback. Um, and so it talks about how they're that the, that we're, we're, quote unquote, losing the race when it comes to telehealth, because in China they don't have enough doctors. So people, um, you know, get their health care uh, um, remotely um, and uh the, uh, the smart cities, um, what else did they talk about that they, um, uh, obviously facial recognition, um, you know, all, you know, all the things that there've been controversies about. Um, and so what happened after COVID is that Eric Schmidt immediately rebranded all of these pre-existing demands. And suddenly, even though if you look at these, these presentations from just five months ago, they don't mention pandemics. They don't mm -hmm. mention health. It has nothing to do with protecting health. All of this stuff, driverless vehicles, drone delivery, all of it, um, cashless society, all of it, right? It's all been rebranded now as touchless technology, removing touch points, right? So you're afraid to go to the doctor's office. This is the solution. You can have quote unquote telehealth, right? But then you have you know, and this is, you know, I, this is Lana's area of expertise, right? This is what, what we have to worry about. Who is going to have access to your health records, right? Is it, you know, and, and it, this presentation that I, that, and people can follow the link, it talks specifically about how the barrier in um, outside of China and in the, in the U.S., but it's same goes for, for Canada, are the protections for, you know, private patient information. Um, this is also going on in education. So yeah, mm -hmm. so I think that this is a this is a high tech shock doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, and what I was saying before is, and since I wrote that article, now we have two shocks that these tech companies are exploiting: COVID and um, the a, a, and the security quote unquote security concerns um, because of the protests and the uprising. Thank you, Lana. Um, in responding to this question, can you also begin to tie in um, not only the call for race-based data in Ontario in relationship to the emergence of COVID, but also can you begin to tie in the medical records, um, questions around the medical records and questions around how in Ontario in particular, our OHIP, our OHIP cards can be tied into some of these processes? Um, sure, gladly. I think that um, the pieces that Naomi shared have been really important in kind of getting a good baseline of understanding the context that we're in. And so if you think about the information in separate disparate points, you think about medical data over here and medical records over there, um, it doesn't look like much is going on on the surface. But what we have to really think through is that when we talk about race-based data, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, are we thinking about race-based data in the contemporary technological moment? 
in which the things that we understood before no longer hold true. And what I mean by that is historically, we think of data as you fill out a form, the form goes in a filing cabinet, the filing cabinet has a lock, the filing cabinet is locked in a room and it's secure. <clears throat> and it doesn't move from that place until somebody else takes it up and puts it into another filing cabinet. That's often what we conjure, um, especially when people are talking to me. But we forget that every day we're using memory sticks, we're using the cloud. And so in fact, anytime information is in its electronic form, it is simply a data unit. It is simply a, zero, a series of zeros and ones. And so those zeros and ones and equations move very rapidly from place to place. And so the idea that data and race-based data is for health, while it's you know a very naive na idea, it's always a very concerning one because that there's no such thing as just health data. There's data and there's who gets to move the data and who moves the data is who is perceived of being in possession of it and therefore owns it. And so someone can say, oh, we're just taking your health data. Know that that data will migrate to wherever that quote data custodian, data holder wants it to go. And we've already seen an example of that, right? So here in Ontario, we've already seen in Kitchener, Waterloo, where public health without the support or consent of Ontarians, voluntarily handed the data over into a police set of databases. That's concerning because whenever data moves, it leaves a trail and it's very hard to, ever, to get rid of or to vanish. And so we can already see that data that you thought was in your doctor's office is now in a police database that has the ability to link with other data. And so I think that often when we talk about data and um, race-based data, we're thinking about it in this very kind of non-dynamic, um, non-moving form as if there is something that says around health data, oh, I'm health data, I can't go over there. But in fact, what machine learning and AI has decided to do is to produce something called interoperability. The idea that whatever data platform you're on, your phone, a hospital record, a police record, um, an immigration record, that they're able to move around very easily. And so in tying it together, the key piece is to remember that data moves, it does not stay stationary. Um, once it's captured electronically, um, especially in Ontario and Canada, there's very little control that you have as, as an individual over understanding where it goes or where it's been because that part is not transparent to you. And actually many physicians don't even know how their data is held on the back end or where it's being bought and sold. And we've already had those issues come up in Ontario. And at the time, Minister Hoskins was our minister and he stepped in um, and he prevented that. Unfortunately, under our current administration, um, we don't see that happening. We see our data vaults being flung open um, and quote, open for business but most Ontarians do not know what that business is. Thank you. In a previous conversation, when we were kind of preparing for this, both of you um, pointed out the role that the military industrial complex oh. has played in the development of a number of these systems, especially in AI and machine learning. And you suggested that often within, within that industry, um, a certain limit is reached, and then these technologies are released. I think L Lana, you used the term into the feral into the feral scene, and 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 then they sit back and see what c civilians might do with it. And Naomi, in in your piece, you you began to plot out the the links between government and private and philanthropic interests, in particular. Mm -hmm around education and the Bill, mm -hmm. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering if both of you can begin to um, unravel some of these links for us so that we can make sense of where these technologies are coming from and where they might be headed. Um, um, Naomi, do you want to begin? Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways it reflect, like I think one of the, one of the um, challenges we have is that these debates have been um, defined pretty narrowly. And often, you know, when you hear debates around AI, mm -hmm. it, um, it focuses on the huge biases in AI, right? And the, you know, and, and we've had some really, really important critiques 
around the fact that it's, you know, it's humans that are building these systems and it's overwhelmingly white men who are building these systems and they carry their biases with them and people and, 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 um, and so those biases are baked into technologies like facial recognition. Um, and we've seen that black people are, um, you know, misrecognized. We've seen all kinds of misgendering. Um, and that's just one example where you, where, where I think we've heard a lot of the critiques and these are really important critiques. But one of the things that I think is important to understand is the tech companies can handle those critiques um, in the sense that they, um, it, 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 it prescribes the debate, you, you know, so narrowly, right? That they, that, that essentially what we're, what, what they uh, promise is a sort of, um, not that they could ever deliver it, but this sort of um, equitable AI, this, this, um, this discrimination free AI, everybody will be under surveillance equally. Right. Um, and so they just need more data. They just need more research. They just, you know, that they'll improve their AI. Maybe they'll hire some people of color to help improve their technology. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just uh, that is a that is a very live debate and it's a complicated debate because the critiques need to be there. But we also need to be asking the question of do we want facial recognition software, you know, rolled out in our cities? period. Do we want to um, normalize this level of surveillance, period? Because once we allow the debate to just be about bias and not whether we want it at all, we've kind of already lost in a lot of this, right? And that, you know, facial recognition, I mean, this is, that's a classic technology that is, um, you know, it, it, it comes from the kind of the, you know, counterterrorism world, you know, a lot of these, a lot of what we're seeing now around COVID is a has a very strong echo of another shock that was exploited, um, which was 9-11, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, 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 and there's some really interesting parallels where, you know, it, it, there was a very st strong and growing tech lash before COVID, it, manifesting in many forms, you know, you know, like in Canada, manifest manifesting in the in the pushback around sidewalk labs in New York City, the pushback around Amazon headquarters, um, people, you know, communities making connection, connecting the dots between labor exploitation, gentrification, um, cooperation, you know, with 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 ICE, um, surveillance of migrant communities, all kinds of things, and 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 finally, like you know, Amazon just said, okay, well, we don't, you know, if, if this is what it takes to come to New York, we'd rather leave, right? Similar to what's, hap what's happened around sidewalk. But what's interesting about what Eric Schmidt has been saying is like, he very, he's very explicit that they see COVID as finally they're getting the gratitude that they deserve. And they see this as a way to make, to do an end run around all of these critiques. Um, but coming back to the issue around education and whether or not we're, we are having as um, broad a debate as we need to have, or whether we are allowing it to be narrowly defined in a way that really benefits these private players. Um, a lot of the critiques around remote learning in the COVID period have been about access to tech, right? And that's been totally, it's, th those are really, really, really legitimate um, uh, critiques, right? Where in an instant, it was like, oh, suddenly we're, everyone's learning online, right? Um, and, and schools just you know, move their lesson plans online, and um, and and huge numbers of students have just mm -hmm. completely gone off the grid. Right, mm -hmm. um, their teachers can't find them; they can't communicate with them, and we are losing. We are losing millions of young people. Right, and here I'm talking about you know the pre-secondary uh, uh, um, uh, education, but similar, you know, this is also happening. Uh, I teach at Rutgers, which is a very diverse public university um, with a lot of working class young people. And as they all moved home and we went to remote learning, um, you know, we, we lost students, we lost students, absolutely. But the many of the debates that we've heard so far, and, and I think we all know this, have focused on mm -hmm. how do we get everybody wired? Mm -hmm. How do we get everybody tablets? Mm -hmm. How do we get everybody laptops, right? Um, and we haven't had a, a deep conversation about mm -hmm. what other alternatives do we have? Are, are there, like, given that 
crowded classrooms of 30 to 50 kids, um, you know, in the context of a pandemic that we don't have a, a vaccine for, we have to think about that. But there are other things that we can be talking about. We can be talking about having the size of our classrooms. We can be talking about having a better in-person experience for, for students. We can be talking about outdoor education. We can, um, you know, there, we, there are other conversations to be had other than how do we get everybody computers. Now, one of the things that happens if you're the one of one of the kids with the donated tablets is you don't have control over that tech, right? And there are definitely there have been a, there have been court there have been court cases in the U.S. in case and this is pre-COVID, where kids were given um, you know laptops, tablets um, in order to close the digital divide, right? Um, and it turns out that they were being filmed in their bedrooms, and um, it, you know they, they lost all privacy. And so I think that this is um, these surveillance technologies, right, which we are going to see migrate once we realize, okay, well, these kids are on Zoom. How do we know whether they're paying attention? Well, how do you think we're going to find out how they're paying attention? We're going to put them under all kinds of surveillance in their homes, in, in their private spaces. And it isn't just their space. It's their family space, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that that it is, it, it's, a, it's a migration of military tech, but it's also a migration of carceral tech, right? Um, where where technologies that were um, kind of road tested in this, mm -hmm. I, you know, the, the the idea of turning turning homes into jails, right, um, uh, is now finding its way into education tech. So, I mean, we we need to have our eyes wide open about that too. And Nana, when you respond to this question, to the same question, can you also, because I know you've been doing some thinking around this, the what, what these kinds of concerns also mean for medical education and medical curriculum? Um, I think that there's a lot of similarities um, and I think there's also some, some differences. So I'm just gonna take the question back a, a little bit mm -hmm. um, to like um, electronic medical records, EMR, and electronic health records, which are EHR. And so I'll use those acronyms. So electronic medical records and electronic health records. So electronic medical records are closer to the old fashioned file format that some of us grew up with. Um, electronic health records are records that are uh, digital. Um, they talk to each other um, and they move more fluidly across systems and they're dynamic. And so I think that when we think about things going into the wild and or the feral space um, and um, the military's, you know, the US and other advanced quote military sites uh, released this technology, you know, ARPA, DARPA, and we got the beginning of the internet. Um, it seemed like really interesting, shiny things. I know that that's what I thought, and I really enjoyed uh, my time um, in figuring out how things work and what they can do. But there's that moment where you stop and you're like, but where are all these data packets going, right? And, and what does it really mean? And so when technology moves from the military into the general population, um, it is an experiment underway. The internet has been a large social experiment. Um, and it's one that like all experiments we should be aware of and watch very closely and monitor for unintended consequences and then put in the appropriate regulations and laws. Unfortunately, when it comes to electronic medical and electronic health records, um, some of the most important things like market share and do we want just a few people holding all of Canada's uh, public health dollars in the form of records um, in their hands? And so, for instance, many Canadians don't know that only more or less four companies um, own 90% of the electronic health and medical records in this country. Um, one of them is a, a telecom come health company, and that's TELUS. And when we look at the markets, we see that Google and Amazon, um, who have been moving aggressively into the healthcare market, um, are using their relationships. And many of those organizations, as you're well aware, in the tech will build it resistance, um, are heavily invested in military contracts and are using those military contracts to inform their retail business. Um, and so when it comes to looking at electronic medical and health records, the real question here is, do we need to be worried about mar market concentration? And given what we know, for those who have been paying attention about 
Snowden and Cambridge Analytica. And for those of you who are watching um, contemporary films coming out, there's one called Influence. We know that the data that machine learning allows um, itself to digest uh, through AI applications means that you can find patterns. And so what does it mean to have a technology that is in the hand of a very few people being able to run patterned inference technologies over your health records? Now you might think, ah, who cares? But when that becomes part of what we became familiar with, um, which is the Cambridge Analytica scandal, what we learned was that the ability to manage that data and use personal data allowed them to inf you know, make inferences into political processes. And we've seen the outcomes of it around the world from the US to Brexit and Canada. We also sit in that uh, deep question that we haven't resolved. So when we think about electronic medical records and electronic health records, we need to understand data is a form of currency just when it comes to just the management, the actual management of a health record, that is a $36 billion industry projected for 2021. And so we have to understand that when we talk about four companies, we're talking about a particular kind of movement of capital that was derived from trillions of dollars of public investment. That means that me and you paid lots of tax dollars across many different governments to have the health system we have. But guess what? you're not the ones who are benefiting from it. And the way the current business model works, I'm not sure we would want to be the ones to benefit from it, most importantly. But what it means is this is a very attractive site of profiteering. And in order to profiteer, it means that they have unfettered control and access and that we remain in complete ignorance and a lack of understanding. One of the things that was deeply concerning for me, because I'm working on a pulmonary function testing in order to remove some of the insidious um, race-based uh, science that's within that diagnostic process and the extra instr instrumentation. As I looked at developing prototypes and doing the adoption, I started to notice like, hold on. So what happens when I, I build this and what happens when I do that? And I looked around, I'm like, okay, you know, I'd like to have the highest standard of ethics. So I look at GDPR and I have to ask myself, why after so many years of GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation, which is the European Union standard to which um, Britain is not any longer a formal part of due to their departure from the union, but it's a standard that any country working within or with European countries through which data will travel must meet that regulation. And so the GDPR took a few years to pull together. We had a lot of Canadian participation at those tables internationally. So we had a lot of Canadians who were professors, bioethicists, flying to Geneva and all the different sites. And it begged the question, so why don't we have the highest standard of data protection? Why is Europe the one who's battened down the hatches? And we know why. Their premiers, their prime ministers, their presidents have been very clear. They want to remain data sovereign and politically sovereign. They do not want to be compromised politically. They do not want their public services compromised. And they want to decide how their trillions of euro dollars will be moved and invested within Europe, not in the tech war between the East and the West. Europe has put up its protection walls, if you will, taking from the American building of walls. Um, and they've done that with GDPR, but GDPR um, allows data to move in a way that is protected and a way that is safe. So when you have the general data protection regulation, GDPR, it means that if we had it here in Ontario, which we should be demanding, it means that you would actually know when your data takes flight. You would actually be able to say, oh, hold on, you didn't ask me to use it administratively. Right now in hospitals, they take your data and they cut it, they splice it, they make decisions, they share those with insurance companies. They do all kinds of things that most Ontarians and most Canadians would gasp at. Because when I explain to people my work, they're like, what? They could do. And I'm like, oh, yeah, like that's just a thing. I mean, if you don't like it, you're going to have to speak up. And that's where I say um, we have to ask a question very similar to what you put out, Naomi, and that is, given that these are war technologies that have migrated into fun, shiny things that aren't so fun and shiny anymore, we have to decide, do we want our data being monetized in a way that compromises us down the road? And just as I end on that point, when I say compromise, I mean that when it comes to identity theft, we are wide open 
because there's a process called the identification, which I'll describe um, shortly, that they say, oh, you know what, we'll just strip off your name and we'll strip off your address and it's de-identified and you're golden. Unfortunately, that hasn't been true since 2007 because the technology has changed. But what that means is all of these de-identified data sets floating around, particularly from Canada, because we're attractive, because we're a cosmopolitan country, means that some of the more profitable nefarious sides can very easily assemble that data and reassemble you in a different country, different geolocation, and it would be very difficult for you as a layperson to be able to afford the legal representation or support to roll that back, much less even figure out how it happened. You would be saying to an officer, I have no idea what you're talking about, and they would be reaming off a bunch of things, and you would be on the hook for a retainer in the double digits at minimum. So we go very quickly from having a war technology become a let's throw it into the feral reality and see what happens when some folks get their hands on it to our appointment with our doctor's office and then back into huge markets where many of us have no idea that that journey even happened. So thank you thank you for those responses. One of the, one of the things that um, becomes really evident and when we when we have these kinds of conversations is that our suspicion or critique can very much um lend itself to a certain kind of paranoia and only today in ontario again to use that as another as an example the premier announced um 300 million for broadband in an attempt to bridge the digital divide between um, the rural and the urban and so on. Now, of course, some people quickly pointed out that this announcement is actually money that was announced um, a year ago, <laughs> so it's not new money, and that it was in fact a cut from spending from the previous governments who had announced 500 million. But having said that, um, I'm raising this as an example to get, to get you both to talk a little bit about why is that we might find ourselves in a certain kind of ethical dilemma? Because on the one hand, in this moment of of COVID, the COVID crisis, where you know these screen technologies and screen practices are are, are being offered up to us as a way to bridge the social, um, this kind of spending that was announced also seems to offer those who had been cut out a certain kind of promise. And I'm wondering if we can begin to to broach a conversation about the ethics of, of these technologies, the ethics of these data flows, and the ethics of access to these technologies. Um, Lana, do you wanna pick up first and then we'll go to Naomi? Uh, yeah, gladly. And I want to kind of stress <clears throat> a separation of some things. I want to tease out the difference between ethics and laws. And so an interesting thing happened in the field of, of AI uh, machine learning, and that is something called this hyper awareness of ethics. I'm sure many people have passed a news um, heading um, or seen magazines or seen ads around ethics in AI, equitable AI. Um, and you know, for those of us who had our thinking caps on, we kind of were like, why are we talking about ethics when only regulations and laws can govern and um, allow for an oversight process? And so what we've come to find out through a wonderful article in The Intercept um, was what we had suspected, many of us who were watching the field unfold, um, was in fact true that um, those companies who are deeply invested in machine learning and AI technologies for whom um, their actual dividends and shares and market worth was determined uh, by their ability to man manipulate these technologies were very invested in having us talk about ethics uh, rather than talking about law and regulation. And so I'm an individual that, um, you know, the reality is I come to the Americas by way of the transatlantic um, enslavement trade. And so that has been a long journey to freedom and the streets are full of black folks and uh, folks that stand in solidarity with us because that was a process by which black people were turned into data, right? So those manumissions, you know, when we look at the names of black people and we look at our own last names, that's about us be being turned into data. And so I'm very aware of how that process works, having studied it economically, geopolitically. And so 
I see the same thing happening here. And what is it that I see happening here is that when we talk about um, rights, it's important to be in a framework where there is oversight, where there is a boundary. And so as people protest now, um, they protest to make sure that the rights that they should be afforded are in fact available to them. However, when we talk about ethics, that's a soft, squishy principle. That's a, you can do it if you want to, it may be unseemly not to, but there is no fine, there is no legal instrument uh, to push back. And so I think it's very important that we don't um, end up on a fool's errand, that we don't spend time invested in developing, you know, detailed agreements around ethics beyond a skeleton framework. Um, because in fact, unless you can enforce those ethics with regulation and law, which is what the GDPR does, it provides um, fines that are based on your global income, right? So upwards of 4% of a company's global income, that is a disincentive. And so when we look in the case in Ontario, we have no such disincentives. We have fines that are a, a paltry 100,000, 200,000. I mean, if we're not talking in the high millions, when we're talking about companies that have the GDP on a given, any given, have the GDP of most countries, we have to understand that the fines have to match. Um, the restrictions have to match. And so in terms of ethics, I think, yes, they're very helpful for us in an everyday level to think about what it is we should and shouldn't be doing, what is and isn't acceptable, but they must be backed by laws to which um, we can affordably, affordably be able to defend our access to our own data, the protection of our own data and what happens to it. And so I think it's important not to go down the ethics washing road and get caught up in these processes. As I gave a keynote, um, uh, Early this, earlier this year, if my ancestors had gotten distracted by ethics, I would not be able to be here in front of you as a full person before the law, much less in a mixed company. So my ancestors paid in blood and I understand that price. And I think it's important that we don't get distracted by empty promises of ethics. It's hard enough to get the law to work in our own favor. So we need to move, work with something that's not a completely moving target. So I just want to make sure we just put a baseline there. So as we go forward, folks who may not be familiar with the ways in which big tech and big data companies paid, underwrote lobbyists, directed academic departments, incentivized people to hold a plethora of conferences. We have well over 4,000 different ethics standards for AI and machine learning. However, we have a rising ocean of algorithmic racism. We have a question about what world do we wanna live in? And the GDPR with additional tweaks is closer to that. Where we are in Ontario is deleterious and problematic. I need folks to look at Bill 188, Schedule 6, that went into assent without, with very few people's knowledge on March 25th. Just type it into Google, ELA Ontario, Bill 188, Schedule 6, and you'll notice it's problematically vague. I'll stop there. Okay. I I couldn't hear you, Ronaldo. Well, I was just saying, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. Um. Um. Yeah, Len. I was just thinking as you were speaking. Um. I teach a course on surveillance capitalism, and I start with um, Simone Brown's book, Dark Matters, uh, on the surveillance of blackness. Um. And Simone Brown. Um who teaches at UT now, but is a Torontonian, um, to, you know, uh, unpacks the, the word biometric, right? The, 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 the measuring of, uh, measuring attached to the body, right? Um, and, and makes the argument that it's not a high tech process. And she, um, she, she, she talks about writes about the the branding of slaves as the original biometric technology, um, uh, the the original measuring um, uh, through the, the the through the markings of the body. Um, so, you know, Ronaldo, the 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 example that you gave of this 
um, big announcement about broadband, I think it's a really important reminder of the fact that there are these huge public subsidies that are going into these private tech companies. Um, and what they are calling for when they, when they embrace this um, framing around closing the digital divide is governments, taxpayers, um, building the infrastructure that they will then reap massive profits from. Um, Canada has some of the highest uh, um, uh, cable and internet rates in the country. It's a duopoly, um, as most things are in Canada. Um, and uh, and so I, I think a lot of this begs the question around, you know, if these are really essential technologies, right? Um, if we, and, and you know, and, and, and I, I think everybody should have access to the internet. Um, you know, in this day and age, it is a huge problem not to have access to the internet. Um, but if this is truly an essential service, why are we allowing it to be privatized? And if it is taxpayers who are subsidizing it and always have, I mean, these are, you know, it, as we talked about earlier, these are were originally military technologies that have migrated um, and the public is still underwriting it, is still paying for it. Um, and so if, and so we need to be talking about a digital commons um, and, um, and, it, and I think maybe that is, I, I'm less hopeful, well, I don't know, I don't want to put words in Lana's mouth. I mean, I don't know that we ever will be able to regulate these companies without um, just, I think there's only so much we can do with good regulation. I also think there needs to be some expropriation. I, I also think we need to be talking about, um, you know, if this is so essential to daily life, if this is if this is becoming more and more essential to education and health, um, then then we need to keep more of it in, in in public hands. And this is a really big backdoor to privatization of the public sphere, as we've already been discussing. Right. Um, we're seeing it in public universities already. It's true for the health Canadian healthcare care system. Um, this is this is the way privatization is going to begin. Um, because we're taking it as a given that we have to go to private companies. It has to be Amazon who has the, you know, the information in the cloud. And by the way, we're seeing some of this in the context of COVID around, uh, around um, contact tracing and, and apps, right? The, the Australian government, for instance, um, has um, made opening up the economy con sort of contingent on um, on, on the majority of Australians downloading this app that allows for contact tracing, um, but they gave the contract to storing the data to Amazon. Um, so even if it's a government app, it's a private company that's got the data. Um, so I think it's a you know I think I think it's I think it's a combination of regulation. I'll, I'll use the word expropriation, or we can talk about a commons, um, but also. The questioning of whether of whether we want the machines there at all, right? So that there are some, you know, that, that we can't accept as a premise that every aspect of life is going to be turned into data, that everything is going to be mediated by machine, right? I think part of the fight for liberation in the future is the fight from freedom from screens. Period. Um, uh, and so, and so, I think it's like it's 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 a multifaceted move that we need here right that that is that, that 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 when we are online we have these rights and we have to defend these rights um um we have to defend the public sphere we have to we have to create a digital commons and we need to interrogate the the, the machine mediation of life um because I, I also even i think from a mental health perspective and even from an environmental perspective there really isn't the capacity to have this much data and not um, require so much energy that it's absolutely untenable. And here I'm you know, drawing on the work of Ben Tarnoff, who wrote a really good um, piece about the you know, intersection of like a green, a green New Deal and, 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 and tech and, and, and came to the, you know, he came to the conclusion, I think he's correct, um, that, that ultimately there is no green tech um, that doesn't interrogate the question of whether or not every aspect of our life can be mediated by screens and machines because that creates so much data that needs to be stored. 
Um, and that storing requires so much energy um, that um, that really there is no way for it to be green. And I know that's not like our our, our primary concern here, but it's just an example of how, I, you know, I think whether it's ethics or whether it's green, there is a tendency to want to be able to have all the shiny toys and all the tech and, 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 and yet have it be perfectly ethical and have it, you know, be good for our mental health and, you know, be good for the environment. And I'm not sure it's possible to, to do that, but I, I'd love to hear your, your take on that, Lana. Um, is it okay if I jump in? Um, so I, I do want to talk about the environmental aspect. I, I gave a talk um, late last year um, and I looked at the, in, spectrum, the entire life cycle of what we have imagined as machine learning and AI. I found that when I was talking to people and they were like, oh, so, you know, what are you doing your PhD on? What does it mean to be a PhD candidate? Oh, so tell me about your comprehensive exam. And so when I begin to describe it, they're like, okay. And I said, but what's really concerning is that anything I add, I have to be mindful. Like when I think about changing a technology from the analog world, or as I have named it in my uh, PhD work, um, pre-AI um, or proto-AI, there is a use of materials that are not at this point materials that can be broken down. And when I followed the chain, um, and when we talk about this being the decade of people of African descent, we can't um, disappear that the current amount of technology, every phone, every app is literally coming out of two places primarily in term of, terms of minerals. And that is the continent of Africa and the Americas. And what's really interesting is that all of the leftover phones that you no longer use are being disposed of in a set, set number of countries and they're producing horrible poisonings of heavy metals, in people's water tables and in their bodies and causing cancers. And so when you look at the shiny toys um, that are being brought before us, and in medicine in particular, because I'm interested in clinical interventions, um, and I'm in the Department of Rehabilitation, and when I was just doing the math, saying, okay, if we do X number of interventions across X number of disease profiles, I literally had to sit back because where those minerals come from it means sure, not only environmental disaster, which we already see in the Republic of Congo, but it also means a huge displacement, a creation of um, stateless people. And we've already had that happen. To have the era, to have the tablet, to have to go from the boom box to the little disc that we have now, that has caused civil unrest. The, the arms that are moving across the continent of Africa and through South America move not just for illicit narcotics. The other big addiction that we have that no one's talking about is this multi-trillion dollar addiction to technologies that require metals. And so it does tie back because who gets stuck living in and near landfill right here in Canada? Black and Indigenous people. We can look at Nova Scotia and Something in the Water. That's a documentary. It's a book. Please take a look at it. And we can see how black Nova Scotians have been, had their health endangered for generations by having some of the highest cancer rates. Why? Because dumps and environmental poisonings are put in their neighborhoods. They never live near one, but then the city brings it. And that's how environmental racism works. So for we as black folks and for other racialized folks and particularly black and indigenous folks, we need to understand the environmental question here is one of, being able to be free people, being able to have access to clean water and air, and how long before we have to pay for the oxygen that we breathe too. So I don't think these things are um, at all separate. And for me, as someone who's looking at you know, rehabilitation and COVID, respiratory rehabilitation is huge. I have deep concerns mm. about how pulmonary function, because of the race medicine in it, will continue to disadvantage people. I've done the math. The numbers are horrifying. And so when we think about, or when I think about, you know, bringing that technology forward in a better prototype, um, I have to also think about, so we get shiny, better pulmonary function testing here at the expense of our brothers and sisters there. So what does solidarity look like in the age of machine learning and AI? Because what they're teaching in medicine and what they're teaching in the faculty of computer science is, code till your heart's content, <laughs> as if when you hit that keyboard, you're not taking someone's water, snatching their air, or removing the ability to have arable land and food. And mm -hmm. so these things aren't separated. And when we wanna be 
responsible clinically, we can't solve one medical or population health issue and create and spawn several others. And that's the predicament I found myself in. It's part of why this summit is as it is, because I wanted to make sure that when all these conversations that are happening among brilliant black folks in their living rooms and the street corners, get out here so we can talk together, but also so that I could share that learning that I'm getting. And sometimes I'm just, I'm spinning. I'm just like, wow, I just wanted to, make a thing over here and it was it's really cool and it, it improves everything but i did not bargain for the fact that i would be contributing to harms and so i've taken a good chunk of my phd time to step back and to build the controls and hence a protocol right mm -hmm. um to have these conversations to make sure we're going into something in agreement mm -hmm. rather than being in a rush to be first which we're very much encouraged and incentivized in the academy i could have popped that thing out so quickly i've got it sketched got it done today. but when i i was like oh and for what and to what end mm -hmm. and so this is part of what the um whole shock doctrine does it speeds things up so you don't have a chance to think and so you're incentivized to rush to market and you're incentivized to buy into a colonial kind of heroism that actually endangers a whole set of people who are your kin because we're not mm -hmm. separate no matter what we look like mm -hmm. it all comes back and yeah. so i think it's really important to understand that when we think about um data and tech it's not magic and that's one of the reasons i did that talk because people kept talking as if it was magic and i'm like no there are people who are being tossed off their land. Um, there are environmental damages from all the mercury and the leaching that you don't see after you take your shiny gift home. Um, and in the hospital environment, the sheer amount of innovation was why I was staggering because I was looking at, quote, the hospital of the future at a medical conference in Toronto, um, the first machine learning medical conference at um, right there on uh, Bay um, and downtown. And there was no conception of who was going to pay for this. Mm -hmm. But yet they could talk about grassy narrows. And I thought like, how does this work? <laughs> it was your titans of the forestry and mining industry that made that mess. And so we have to ask if of the tech titans, if we're going to allow them to pollute in that way and are we going to be complicit in it? So mm -hmm. Naomi, I think everything you said fits completely together. There is nothing separate here. And that's, and that's part of the trick that we have to pay attention to so we don't get um, left with a treat we don't want. Yeah, I, I think that your point about speed, it, you know, it's so important. And of course, this is, um, you know, coming, circling back to education and this sort of like, um, you know, education under capitalism and, 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 and this sort of the fear of being left behind or, or, or having any kind of, um, any kind of pause, right? Um, that was what that speed was about. Like you weren't, and there were educators who were saying, you know what, we actually have to ask the question of whether or not this year can be completed because there actually is no way to complete this year's education and not sacrifice millions of kids. And that, mm -hmm. that you know, that, that was just an unwillingness to, to, to consider the possibility of getting off the treadmill, you know? And it was just, um, you know, just, just, just doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how many people are, are, are falling behind. You know, I have, I have a, a child with special needs. He can't learn over Zoom. It's not possible. And, and, and it's just, it's just triage, triage. Keep it going, keep it going. Um, and so, and, and, and so it's all interconnected and, it, and, 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 and I think if there's one, um, if there's one silver lining in any of this, I think it's that a lot of people are really aware that this is no way to live. Um, you know, having kind of, we've had a sort of a fast forward version of the future that Silicon Valley was trying to, um, actually bring a little slower because because it you know if, if it comes in more slowly there's less resistance you know it's just little bit by bit and then it's normalized right mm -hmm. but we we actually 
slammed forward into all e-commerce, you know, all delivery, all streaming, all zooming, all, you know, and, and, and actually you hear a lot of people go, this sucks. I hate this, right? This is a mental health crisis. Um, you know, this is not, this is no way to live. I miss touch. I miss community. And I think that as, you know, yeah, we are like educators, but we're also organizers. And I think that we, you know, and storytellers, and I think it's really important to help people hold on to that feeling. It's an important insight, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I don't, I, like, even though there is that, you know, shock doctrine opportunism, you know, and they're absolutely trying to take advantage of all that disorientation, I, like, I don't think they would have wanted it to go this quickly. Um, because it's, it actually has more of an opportunity for people to go, whoa, that was no way to learn. Um, I love your, your pointing out to the pushback. And I think that one of the things that we really do have to think about is what are we pushing back against and what are we pushing for? And so when you talked about those other options for education, um, we have to think through that as well for health. Um, when we think about health, is it really about just being able to move files across systems as quickly as possible so that your doctor now can get you out in 1.5 minutes rather than 4.7 minutes? And that's what we're talking about because people don't seem to understand what the arc of clinical care is for the everyday person. And it is not a better, more efficient version of what you have because that's not how business model works. And I'm sorry to tell you, as much as I am a humanitarian, uh, you know, I love us all to be able to walk in the woods. I'm also really good in business. And I can tell you that there is no business model in which the length of your engagement, the quality of your care will increase in your perception. It will increase for those who market you the services because they will increase their profit margins. That is what business does. If you get a bump in quality to retain you as, cu as a customer, then great. But that's not the purpose of business. The purpose of business is to make money. And the purpose of healthcare should be to heal and sustain wellness. Those two things do not go well together. And we can see that in the United States of America, where they have some of the most advanced technologies, but only the 1% get access. You know, sometimes we hear people in Canada wanting a private system. And I'm like, can you afford that premium? I'm like, why don't we get online and see what it would cost you? People's mouths fall open, but they're very quick to critique, quote, wait times. And so mm -hmm. I think when we think about this, it's what do you want for your health care? And do you want it to be a floating voice on a telephone, a holodeck in your living room, which sounds really cool right now, but people being able to pop in and out of your house tells you something about the directionality of the signal and the way it would have to be open for that to work. So there's a whole bunch of stuff behind that scene that doesn't make your home your home anymore to enjoy some of those technologies for pedestrian folks. And you I want to take up this question here um, around, can you please address how American healthcare companies may want our race-based data to harmonize our healthcare systems? And what that's a huge question. And so again, one of those wonderful <laughs> surprise things, you're going down the road, do, 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 all happy, I'm done comms, I'm the PhD candidate, I'm running towards completion. And then I'm like, but what's all this stuff? Like, why so much focus over here? You know, I listen. And I pay attention and look at the equations, look at the coding. And I'm like, this is about data harmonization. Well, yeah, of course. Do Ontarians know that one of the byproducts and one of the desires is for the tech companies, they want us to keep this debate of race-based data going. This is in their best interest to make us think it's part of a civil rights struggle. It's happened to us as black folks before. We have been sold an opportunity that then came back to haunt us. Right? And so when we think about this moment, we have to think about who profits from race-based data. The United States, our African-American neighbors are 37 to 42 million people. That is more than the population of Canada. As black people, and if you understand data sets in business, we are 1.6 million approximately. In terms of business, that's not a big enough number to let it stand by itself. So they're very interested in us coming up and desiring race-based data, because as a country, we've been quite annoying, as our American counterparts would say, because we have huge fields missing around what race you are. Like, how do you know who's black and white and mulatto? Like, we can click buttons and find that out. And I'm like, you know, I never was a fan of apartheid, so I'm not a fan of it now. 
because that is the system that race-based data comes from. And that's the system the profit comes from. And so when we think about race-based data, it is about harmonization. The majority, I just finished telling you, of the EHR companies are American. Those that will consume those current um, market spaces, it's going to be a battle. Tells can try to hold on. I'm not sure, but when I look at the liquidity of Google and I look at where Amazon's coming down the back with logistics tying directly into provincial um, desires for efficiency and being able to take over those systems for less. And let's understand that they have an interesting model where they don't even land, so they don't have to comply with any of the jurisdictional issues because they just take it from the air. So no HIPAA, no PIPA for them. Um, and so I think it's really important to understand that when we talk about this kind of thing, we're talking about a certain kind of bundling and to make that profit valuable. Why would a company make two sets of EHR and EMR products for a country that is not even as large as the African-American population, which is only approximately 12% of the US. So it is in their best interest for us as black people to fall into the apartheid race trap, reify race, attach ourselves to a system that all critical black race scholars say, as Ruha Benjamin did at the end of part one, whatever you do, don't do what we did because we never selected it. And anything you see in that system is not something of our desire. I've even heard folks talking about data, um, race-based data in the US had to do with the civil rights movement. No, it had to do with a state that was white supremacist that continued to kill black people and they were grabbing for any tool possible to show that. But that is not where we are because we have the ability to manage our own data without going to the state, without putting ourselves in harmonization's way because it means we'll get the same products that the United States produces for its citizens and the data is clear on that. The US has some of the greatest technologies in health, but it has the lowest utilization rates because it's based on racial capitalism, who has and who doesn't. And so those advances are some total null for the vast majority of Americans. And with data har harmonization, the same would come to pass for us. One thing that I think um, uh, we also, we, we need to be thinking about, I mean, Ronaldo, you talked earlier about that passage in my piece about China, um, where uh, the, the, that telehealth was being discussed in the context of a country that, according to um, you know, this presentation made to the US government, um, has this severe shortage of doctors, right? Um, and so telehealth is like the solution to a shortage of doctors. So I'm just flagging that because I think that we need to be really, really um, uh, attuned to the fact that we're headed into an austerity crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, the shocks haven't stopped, right? There's COVID, um, you know, there and and there are the uprisings and the massive repression and the data that is being extracted now and the normalization of of of, of all kinds of new toys on the streets uh, of the United States right now. Um, military uh, military wear and privatized uh, uh, um, surveillance mm -hmm. that that is being collected by tech companies um, just in case it's useful down the road to police departments. So you've got that. But the other thing we need to be aware of is that there has our governments have just spent a massive amount of money and they're not finished. Um, trillions of dollars has been injected into the markets worldwide um, in order to prevent a even deeper collapse. And already this is coming back in the form of budget crises in public hospitals, public universities, public schools. Um, you know, I mean, they're talking about, you know, entire states declaring bankruptcy in the United States, right? Um, and so when telehealth is, is being talked about as a way to have fewer doctors, right? And, um, you know, Alberta is already laying off teachers and, and education workers. Um, you know, obviously the Ford government, it, you know, if, the, if they're spending big on, uh, on, on broadband, we need to be very, very, very worried, right, about what this looks like down the road and who is going to be asked to accept 
telehealth instead of mm -hmm. having a doctor in their community, right? Um, oh, and whose kids are going to be told, oh, yeah, you've got an education. And yeah, your kids can just do this online course work during COVID, right? Um, you know, at, we talked about this earlier, but you know, it's, it's always telling that the, you know, Silicon Valley masters of the universe don't let their kids on screens till they're 10 years old, right? Um, you know, the, the ultimate luxury is opting out of these technologies, right? These are garbage ways to learn. It's terrible way to get healthcare, right? Um, but, you know, if you're in a country that is constitutionally required to provide healthcare and education to everyone, this becomes an opportunity to tick that box, right? Oh, sure, yeah, we're providing healthcare to that Northern community or education to that Northern community. Um, and so the intersection of these technologies and the austerity crisis that is in the, the pipe, right, is what is really, really frightening to me. Um, and so I, um, I want to do a little shout out to my friends at The Leap who, who um, have been live tweeting this event. Um, because, you know, this is the moment where we need to be bold, right? Where we're, when people still have that living memory of how much money suddenly governments were able to find um, and, um, and understanding like, wow, like when you recognize that something is a crisis, mm -hmm. all kinds of things are possible, right? Mm -hmm. It is possible to put public health ahead of private profit. We, we saw that for a little while there, right? And of course, it, the, the, the more time that goes by, the more that that memory recedes, right? So in a moment when people have that memory mm -hmm. of the ability to act boldly, um, you know, look, I mean, in the UK, they, they, they privatized, uh, they, they nationalized private hospitals in, in, in the midst of COVID. All kinds of things are possible. You can get car, car, car manufacturers to... Um. I'm going to jump in there if you don't mind, yeah. Ronaldo. Yeah. Oh, there, you're oh, back. Sure. Wonderful. Um, you're back, Naomi. We got you. We can see oh. you. <laughs> oh, how you... long was I out for? <laughs> Just I, was really, I was really on a rant there. <laughs> um, did you want to continue or did you want to switch oh, over? I don't know when I got cut off. Um, I was, you were talking did you hear of, any of the yeah. Leap stuff? You said that you're giving a shout out to the Leap and that many things are possible. And in Britain, they nationalize private hospitals. And so you they can the find money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Basically, you know, socialism. <laughs> Let's push it. Um, I don't know if you want me to go in, in there, um, Ronaldo, in the gap, or if you have another question coming. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, I'm sitting here and listening to the conversation and I'm thinking, about there's something about how old this new digital screen culture is mm -hmm. that is still a culture of extraction a culture of mining uh, a culture of commodity and a culture that is structured to produce have and have nots um to produce elites and non-elites and so on and so i'm i'm thinking i'm also thinking about the language that we're using to push back on it too so I'm thinking about Naomi's digital commons. I'm thinking about Lana, you and yourself, data sovereignty. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering what kind of state this portends for us. What kind of state are we going to have to be working to invent in the face of this? Because as much as it sounds really new, it also okay. sounds really old and deeply familiar. Lana? Um, I, I think you're right. I mean, technologically, you're right. And also um, sociopolitically, you're right. So sociopolitically, um, in the social and political realms, for a very long time, we've had this issue. And again, I draw you back to my very presence here. Um, in terms of what did 1492, the transatlantic slave trade mean, it meant that we got a new global economic system. And it's a system that shifted and it changed markets and it created the markets we now know and understand. And without that massive transfer of human um, labor um, for free, but it wasn't for free, it costed us our lives and centuries of freedom, it created a new, po a new set of possibilities for a particular kind of system that was extremely violent would need to maintain violence. And we can see that that violence cannot end in order to support it. 
Um, we can change the mechanisms. We can go from hand-to-hand um, -hand combat to, quote, surgical strikes by drones. But at the end of the day, it's still a mechanism of harm. And so one of the things I think we need to think about in terms of this older language is it's still the question on the table is what world do you want to live in? And most importantly, how do you want to get there? Because what AI and tech and machine learning is offering us is only one possible path. And within that path, there are many. But as Naomi pointed out, we are being pushed at a hurtling speed in order to keep us disoriented and not to make choices that necessarily are in our own best interest. And that is where I'm interested in the discourse of law and cooperative sites, um, companies and possibilities that are owned collectively. So when I think about capitalizing the technologies um, that I am producing, I think about how is it possible to have a worker owned company? One, because there are some deep thinking that need to be done. Um, and people that are invested and attached are people that are going to think through the other families on the planet they're dealing with. We would be interested in the kinds of taxation that would work for everyone. It's a different kind of way of thinking. So um, cooperative economic ventures can take many different configurations, but it's a different way of being in the world than the one we have. We do have smaller cooperatives, but they're not the majority of our marketplace. And I think that this technology offers that, uh, that opportunity. And I think it's important to be concerned about the how as much as where we want to go to. Um, and I'll kind of place that within a question that was brought up on the side earlier, which is, you know, do we want, um, are records kept by Canadian healthcare companies. Well, if the ultimate goal of that Canadian company is to have the strongest uh, market share by accumulating other companies, then it's gonna get into different kinds of questions around what is the best thing to do for the company versus what is the best thing to do for the people that use this company's services. And so I don't know if it's so much about being Canadian as it is about being very clear about how data will and will not be monetized whom it will benefit and whom it will disadvantage. And so while it is a question about um, national borders, it's a broader question about what are the economic systems? Because as Naomi pointed out, austerity, we saw go around the world um, several times over, but for many of us, it's 2007, 2008, 2009. And that is where we had to come to terms with the fact that the system doesn't work the way that many people thought it did. And so, mm -hmm. I think we need to think about what do cooperative ventures look like? What are the kinds of capitalization instruments that allow us to think commons and not a process that further pushes the bottom out the other side and the top skyward so that almost neither recognizes each other anymore? And I'm deeply interested in how do we continue to live together and not in the streets because we're so inhumanly treating each other, but how do we live together in peace? And that's a process um, and you can't hurdle towards it. Um, you have to negotiate it. And can tech be part of that possibly? But the bigger question is, what is that process that allows us to participate? And we've been on the planet for a very long time, regardless of your perspective. And if we take our time, it's not gonna be a bad thing. Um, China will have its own reckoning. It has its own reckoning. So this, this package that Schmidt keeps presenting is one that is precarious. It is contested within China. The, it burns just like the streets burn in North America. People fight the legislature just like they do here. They are already living on mainland in the draconian future that we are being, that's being forced down our throats in huge gulps. They are already resisting. There is nowhere in China where everybody's like, oh, this is wonderful. That is not what's happening. And so I think it's important to not let ourselves get packaged into believing what Schmidt says is the only outcome. Because the people in China, they're battling that. Mm -hmm. And that's an uncertain outcome. And so trying to get us to compete with a country that is in the process of undoing itself to get free, um, it's not wise to try to compete with them and, and in so doing, losing our freedom and our autonomy. And so I think it's important to not let the disciples of that kind of regime, and many of them are computer scientists, some of them have been hired into our country, and are spouting this to com computational science students, um, that they should not have any boundaries, that they should just go whole hog, that their innovation is so important and don't let anything slow you down. And I think that's very um, un-Canadian, I think it's very inhumane, and I think it is a particular kind of doctrine, and it is another layer of the shock doctrine to expanding and new minds that should be 
thinking about what are the possibilities for the future um, mm -hmm. and not about how to redo the past and get the same results. Mm -hmm. You know, if I might jump in before, Naomi, before you go, if I might add one small wrinkle to this, which is that sometimes the conversation that we are having that, that you and Lana is really leading us on can, can sometimes there's an inference that it might be generational. Oh. So um, there are some sociologists who are telling us that are you that, there's us old <laughs> that, um, that there's a gen that there's old. a generation among us. Yeah, <laughs> that there's a generation among us who the kinds of concerns. And I know we haven't used the word privacy yet, but it's been hinted at repeatedly um, that these concerns are not concerns that some demographics have anymore any longer. And that, and so I would like to bring that, I would like for you guys to bring that into the conversation. Privacy, everything, given everything we've talked about, might seem a bit puny right now, but it is a, it's a, it's a lynch, it's a, a hinge to some of the arguments that you're making and some of the stakes and some of what is at stake. I'll leave it at that. I mean, I, I would just say that I, I actually, I think there's a generational shift going on between maybe millennials and Gen Z where um, I think, well, I don't even know where exactly where these generational lines stop exactly, but I can, I can tell you that, 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 that a few years ago, I think there was a lot of defensiveness around critiques of tech from young people where it felt like, yeah, it was just a generational divide. And, and, um, and, you know, you had a lot of like, no, I can multitask, I can do everything. And you just don't understand that our brains are wired differently. What I find when I teach this, um, you know, when, when I, when, I, you know, I, I, I teach, I've been teaching, as I said, surveillance capitalism, data colonialism, um, uh, to undergrads, um, at, at a public university, um, they are intensely in touch with the, the, the mental health hazards of the way they are all ex expected to live. They have huge concerns about the fact that everything that they do can, as, a, as a young person, as a, as a teenager, can be used against them 20 years down the road when they're trying to get a job, um, they understand that they're being asked to do a huge amount of free labor for tech companies in order to quote unquote, build their brand. They're doing it because they feel they have no choice. Um, and obviously like this is a small sample, but you know, I'm really haunted by this. Um, you know, what, what, when our courses went online, um, it was over March break, um, at, at, at our university at Rutgers. And so when we said goodbye before March break, we didn't know that we weren't going to be seeing each other again. When we did see each other again, everybody was in their little zoom boxes and, and, and the, and, and, and the state that we were in was under, you know, quote unquote lockdown. Um, and we did our, a, a check-in and, uh, and one of the students and about how they were all feeling you know, suddenly being back in their parents' homes and and all and and, and missing each other and and dealing with all kinds of of of, of huge uh, financial issues in their families and you know these you know I have students whose parents are working at Amazon and and Costco and 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 you know who who parents who are you know essential workers and they've all lost their jobs and. But one, one thing one of my students said to me that's really haunted me, she said, what scares me most is how little I had to do in order to social distance, in order to comply with this lockdown. I really didn't have to change very much. And that's, that's the scariest thing of all. Um, and and, and I, I just thought that was so insightful. And, 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 um, I don't know. I mean, my students talk to me. I, I, I'd be interested to know what you find, Ronaldo. But I mean, they're sleeping with their phones next to their bed. They know it's affecting their sleep. It's affecting their dreams, you know. But this idea of 
You know, we were put on government lockdown and told we couldn't leave our homes. And, and the scariest part was how little I had to change because I was already living on a kind of a lockdown. And that's not good. I know that's not good. Um, so, I mean, there's certainly a, like, I, there's no doubt I have a completely different relationship to technology than, than, than people in their twenties. I mean, I'm, you know, useless with technology. Um, and, but I, I, I hear from the young people who I work with that they, um, they, they don't, they feel a lot of what they are doing, they are forced to do, they feel forced to do in, in terms of performing the self, in terms of, you know, of, of, of building followers in order to get a job and, you know, um, and, and, but, but just one other thing I would say, I mean, we, when I first started teaching, teaching this, um, I don't think I did a good enough job of, of, of like we started with the marketing side of it, right? And the social media side of it. And one of my students put up, put up her hand and said, you know, I, you know, look, professor, like, I, I don't, I would rather see ads for things I want to buy than ads for things that like are for like a six foot tall guy, you know, like I, I like the cute stuff they're trying. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I've done a really bad job of explaining the stakes of surveillance capitalism. Let's zoom out here. It is not just about being sold cute pairs of shoes. Um, it's about the fact that the data about those shoes and everything else that is being extracted from us is, you know, and, you know, our health tracking devices and, and the rest of it can be used to discriminate against you to getting a job, um, um, we're now it's now being completely integrated with property te property technology, whether or not you're going to be rented an apartment, um, whether or not you can get insurance and on and on and on. So I think we really have to, um, you know, I, I like I think that I think that I had personally had done a good enough job of explaining why why we should all care. And I think that they actually at this point get it better than we do. I, I would agree with that. Um, and I would agree with that on a, a number of levels. I think that there was a point um, where those critiques had some resonance. But I, what I found um, in terms of I'm, you know, around a lot of twenty somethings um, and uh, early thirty somethings, and they're acutely aware about like they're not into the rat race. They're not feeling it. They're like, I'm not gonna like spend my whole life waiting to retire. Like, what is that? Like, why do you people do that? So they've got very different conceptions of what their time should be worth and what they should be al allowed and able to do with it. And they're very aware that there are limitations because they understand what money is. They're engaging with money and making larger purchases um, than probably any other generation at their age. Right. And so they they have, in my experience and conversations, a deep concern about being ball and chained, quote, end quote, to a bunch of stuff that keeps you locked in a cycle that doesn't make any sense. Because all we really want to do is hang out. Right. Like, isn't isn't that the point of human engagement to actually be engaged with other humans and not be on your tablet and be able to go and hang out? and socialize and do good things. So I think there's a lot more awareness of what does it take to have a full life? And they do see the errors of our, their parents and their grandparents. They want something deeply different. Not always sure how to get it because who is it 20 something? I mean, who is at any age? Um, but in my experience, it's for some the privacy because the idea of being surveilled because they know how much technology is in their life, they don't like it. But the loss of control, this is a generation that's been able to program, pick, select um, on demand and on command. The idea that they are not in control and don't have the levers of control is where I think they're far more acutely aware of how the system works. And so, you know, for them, when I'm talking, they're like, yeah, that opioid thing, the way that family was able to incentivize, like, that's the thing. Like, they don't want to be in systems where they're being puppeted. And so I think that their point of entry might be a bit different. Um, but I think their concerns are probably even more ardent because as uh, we'll see in the panel on Friday, like they're stuck with this for the long haul. Like they're beginning their lives in this. And that idea of having to worry about what you do today, coming back to um, haunt you, 
um, is something that a lot of folks, as they get ready to think about graduate school or their career, they start to tidy up and deal with their um, social media accounts. And that's when they go to these courses or classes or online tutorials and they realize, oh dang, I've got a whole bunch of data that tells things about me that I don't want. And that's a whole rising industry right there, right? And so I think that it's important to recognize that there are a lot of different perspectives around uh, young folks. But I, in my experience, the point of entry has been a desire to have control about how they spend their time and who's controlling them from being able to control that. And I think that's a very interesting point and, and we have some great conversations in that direction. So I don't think it's generational as much as a, a different positionality about where they think control should be. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And I think well, that I think that goes even for the tech work, like I, I think um, th that's true for tech workers as well, for, for, for you know, a lot of what we know uh, about the worst practices, we know because of young tech workers who became whistleblowers, right? Mm -hmm. um, who said like, you know, Amazon is collecting, um, you know, information from, you know, your voices from Echo or um, uh, Siri, you know, we, we, we the, uh, an app, young Apple worker telling us what Siri was collecting. Um, and, you know, Ed Snowden from inside the military. Um, and, and then, as 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 Lana was saying, the tech won't build it movement, um, you know, within companies like Amazon and 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 Google, um, you know, and they've had a real impact. Uh, um, but unfortunately, the moment that we're in now is really all about undoing that impact, mm -hmm. right? Um, so yeah. yeah. Um, behind the scenes, can you can you send us the question? Mm -hmm. Here it is. How do black people go about controlling their own data? I think this takes us back into that territory of data sovereignty, Lana, that you had raised and, and that I was hoping you would speak to because I think it offers a promise, but it also seems to drag along what I would call an old language of, of kind of questions of, of nation, not nation as in the nation state, but nation as these kind of definable communities boundaries of community and so on. And the reason why it struck me tonight in the conversation is because I was thinking that, you know, I've been I've been listening to at the level at the city of Toronto the debate around um data collection in relationship to, to COVID. And just last night I listened to an interview with the psychiatrist um Kwa, Kwa McKenzie. And the reporter was asking McKenzie about um, the collection of this data, COVID data. And the example he gave was the example from um, swine flu, I think, mm -hmm. or- um, H1N1. And H1N1, yeah. And he had all the numbers for the different quote unquote ethnic groups. And I was like, oh, so if you have all the numbers for the different ethnic groups for swine flu, and I didn't hear that debate about collecting the data, What's going on here this time with this debate about collecting the data? And then it suddenly occurred to me, but also the city of Toronto had just released their so-called interactive map. So we know where COVID is right now, for instance, in the city of Toronto. We know it's north of the city, in poor working class and working poor neighborhoods. And we know that the resources for testing and so on has not been sent north of the city. That in fact, the resources have been invested in putting circles in, in wealthier parts of the city. That's a long preamble to get to this question because I, I'm wondering, and, 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 and maybe I'll put it bluntly this way and then you can, I'm wondering if the notion of data sovereignty is not fanciful at this point in time. Um, I'm gonna go on the side of no, it's not fanciful. And, and here's why. If it was fanciful, we wouldn't have a capital market and we wouldn't have corporations. So we know that when we talk about Google, when we talk about Amazon, we talk about Facebook, those are companies that are defining the laws in nation states like Canada, because the EU decided that it was going to muscle up and buckle down and push back. And so all of those companies I listed and several more are literally up against the ropes. They are facing 4% fines, which is hundreds of millions of dollars. 
um, and they're being required to show their receipts, which I mean here, I mean their code, where things go and how things work. And so they're being checked and they're being checked against the boards hard. And I, so we know that data sovereignty is a thing because we know co corporations have made their business to dominate the entire political landscape with their ability to become big tech giants. So we know that as a area, it's viable. We know that it works. The problem is that the sovereign happens to be usually one white dude who's making all the decision with his other friends. Data sovereignty gives us the opportunity to think about what does it mean to do this as a cooperative? How do we think through, do we wanna be datafied? Do we want datafication of every single thing? Because we know what happened in that lesson the last time. That's how me and you got here, Ronaldo, right? Um, that didn't work out well. That's why the streets are full of people because we never stopped that datafication project. It is still underway and we call it social and economic apartheid. And so data sovereignty is not fanciful. It's a functioning business principle. The question is who will profit? Will we profit collectively? Or will we allow a few people to abscond and create a surveillance state where we eke out a living in a new form of feudalism? Me, I'm not really interested in feudalism. It was an interesting social experiment, but it can stay in the 11th, 12th, and 13th century, thank you very much. And so data sovereignty allows us this opportunity for this process. Um, and as the uh, person had put up, you know, what is the pathway? Um, Part of when we talk about the generational divide here, the generational divide that I've been talking about, because I'm somebody who came up in tech and who's very comfortable with it, is that we have folks who are asking the government to do what like I literally have already done. What anybody who is got the skills and the ability and the business sense can do. We don't need a public institution to do what they actually come to ask us to do for them anyways. So in terms of the generational divide, what I've been hearing and why this forum was demanded had everything to do with why are we asking a state that causes much of this harm to do what we can do for ourselves and why are these people asking for these states to do it as if we don't have the technology and the skill. Right here in Toronto, we had the Black Tech Conference. Over a thousand Black Tech um, programmers, coders, investors were here. Um, and in terms of the kind of work that we need, it is very specific. We need to be functioning at a particular standard. So can every and anybody do it? No, but can we do it right now or in some reasonable way? Yes. So I think the generational divide is health administrators and physicians who are not savvy with tech, who don't have skills in the real world of tech mm -hmm. and business and who are making archaic and draconian demands. And unfortunately I stand there with, um, while I'm not a 20 something, that's where I stand because I understand the business and I have the skills to do it. And so. I wanted to come go back to that question because in order to answer um, the person's question around how do we do it, um, we ask the people who have chosen to master those skills, who have those skills to do that. And that's something that we'll be talking about as we go through the second part and what um, Ronaldo was asking me about, which is the Ready for Black Lives, this initiative, these conversations come out of a national project. Um, I started working on um, data collection, not just in research, the ivory tower, but the many ways in which black people are managed through data, through CASs, through state processes, through education systems without any control or knowledge. And so I developed that. It actually took quite a while because very few people grasped, unfortunately, what I was doing at the time. But over the last three to four years, um, we've reached out and formalized that. And so particularly, we went across the country um, last year having conversations with folks in Nova Scotia and BC, um, in Quebec, and discussing like, what is the structure of data? What is the ecosystem? Like fully laying out what knowledge I've had the privilege of gaining, and then asking questions about how would you want this to happen in the biomedical sphere and not. And let me tell you, Black folks are smart as they have always been. They are very quick to catch the trick in the treat. They have asked questions that in the academy we would think they belong in the PhD level, but you don't need a PhD to figure out your life when you are schooled by the reality of circumstance. And so the Ready for Black Lives protocol, which you can see by clicking um, wherever you registered, um, you can see the components of the protocol and we finished that out over this year and we're ratifying it. 
with communities, supporting them in creating and supporting their local interventions. And ours is a, is a layer of a national intervention that takes up some of those finer points that aren't part of everyday life. There's a lot of stuff around synthetic tissues, a lot of stuff around patenting of biological. That's all addressed in this protocol. It took quite a long time to write. I researched protocols around the world and read lots of things on ethics and put that up against my experience in research and science. And let me tell you, I've done a lot of work in HIV research and unfortunately ethics and following the rules quickly go out the window when there's trillions of dollars of research grants and things go sideways very quickly. And I'm seeing that. And just to close off on your question, Ronaldo, um, what generations also see really clearly is they've been the ones to point out the relationship between big tobacco, big pharma, big steel and forestry and say, count me out. Like they can do that, but I'm not screwing over indigenous people. I'm not playing that game. I'm not here for that and they're pushing hard. And we saw that in Canada as all kinds of Canadians stood up with the wet sweat and we continue to stand in solidarity to push back against the original shock doctrine, which is the colonizing state. So I'll leave it there. Do you wanna add anything, Naomi? I mean, I would just, I, I would just emphasize again that we just need to be as expansive as we can be in multiple options on the table, right? I think um, there's a push right now in the tech world around you can control your data, you can own it yourself, right? Um, you can profit from it yourself, right? So you can sort of self-commodify and you can sell your own data. Um, and it's kind of like the ultimate enclosure of the self. And I think that, you know, what I guess, um, I think a lot of what we're seeing now is I think this is a kind of a, um, it is it, it, the, if we think about capitalism as stages of enclosure, um, that begins with the uh, slave trade and the enclosing of land as property that was not previously seen as property and hum humans as property and then the neo the neoliberal stage as the as the um the 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 privatization and pilfering of the state right um that i think that the data stage that we're in right now is about putting all human relations mm -hmm. onto platforms where they can be mined, where they can be extracted, where they can be enclosed. And so I think if we want sovereignty over this, we have to, um, we have to decide what, you know, wh where are the advantages, conveniences of this great enough that we do want to move this into a form where it can be extracted. Um, and for that, those activities, how do we, um, how do we ask questions about what, you know, for instance, like just because some, ju just because it's possible to extract data doesn't mean that that data has to be saved, for instance, right? And this is something that Snowden has really emphasized. Um, that a lot of what we need to be fighting for is for the data just not to be saved at all, right? So that you can get certain conveniences, but it doesn't have to, there doesn't have to be an archive, there doesn't have to be a trace um, in every case. Now, in some cases, it is beneficial to have that. But, you know, this is, um, you know, I think that that's one of the areas where we have to work. Um, I think there's big debates now, you know, in, in real time, right, we are seeing the benefits of, of, of social media um, for social movements where, uh, you know, where we've all been watching uh, um, video collected by people in the streets that is that is exposing police brutality. Um, we're seeing, you know, uh, the ability of, of journalists to expose their employers, even at the New York Times, um, you know, and this is just like the past few hours, right? Um, but just because there are powerful things about these tools doesn't mean that we should be accepting this massive concentration of 
information and power in the hands of three dudes, right? Um, and you know, it's worth remembering that these social media platforms are running on free labor, are running on free content that we are all producing for them every time we tweet, every time we post, right? Um, so I think if we are thinking about it in information commons, I think we should be thinking about, um, you know, rather than having a debate about whether or not Mark Zuckerberg should decide what we see and what we don't see, because obviously he shouldn't, right? Mm -hmm. We should be having a conversation about whether we, as the content creators of these platforms, have the right to be running them more like cooperatives, whether, you know, whether or not we... Um, you know, we, there should be real democracy on these platforms. Um, you know, obviously this is very, very broad strokes here, but um, I think it's, it, this is a moment where we are seeing the tremendous perils of this concentration of power and, and money in the hands of these tech companies who, by the way, have gotten so much richer during this pandemic, um, have expanded their wealth by hundreds of billions of dollars as a group. Um, and and we are also really seeing the utility of it, right? Um, and and we're, we're 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 always given this choice of, of like we have this um, binary decision to make: do we want it as it is, or do we not want it, right? And the idea that we could actually shape it, that we have rights as co-creators of it, um, never gets discussed. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to um, paraphrase a question that came in. And, and, and I'm going to request two things of you. One, to respond to the question, and two, to say a couple of things that you would like our audience to take away from this conversation because we're moving towards closing. So here's my attempt at paraphrasing this question. One of the things that happened um, in the moment of 9-11 and, and, and its own institution of, one of the outcomes of its own institution of the shock doctrine was that we, we moved the passport towards the electronic passport um, with all kind of biometric data encoded in it. And one of the ways that we are being told that we might be able to come out of COVID is the production of the COVID passport. It's very interesting to see how these two passports might find themselves aligned, that the that the, the post 9-11 passport may also be the COVID passport that allows us to cross national borders as well. And so I'm wondering if you guys might want to reflect on that and, and what it might mean for us. And also I want you guys to say, what are the two things you would like your audience to take away from this? <laughs> I'll jump in if you don't mind, Naomi. Go ahead, Lana. So I think one, I want to offer a heavy caution here. Um, we've been through the passbook culture. Um, we still have the passbook culture and artifacts here in Canada. So for our Indigenous First Nations, Métis, Inuit, brother and sister, they still have to live with the passbook as the uh, status card. And um, there are deep concerns about what, that will, what will happen with that in relation to additional technologies being attached to it that are currently not being spoken about with or to um, the individuals that will and nations that will be um, left with them. And so I think when I we talk about this passbook and pass card, we have to recognize it's already here. So passbook culture is apartheid culture, right? Let's be very clear. It is when folks go into countries and nations to which they were not invited that we begin to create these instruments as is the case. Canada and North America has the pass Port because black people who wanted to retain and secure their freedom moved between one former colony into another colony. And that is actually the genesis of the past port. So do read Simone uh, Brown's work. Um, she's a Canadian, she teaches in uh, the US. And so that's talked about. We have the past book and that is South Africa. That is in Canada. That is in any of the countries in which black people were moved into or in which white settlers came into. And so we can't think about the past book and the passport without asking ourselves, are we willing to go back down the apartheid road because these things are inextricable, right? And so this is why I also write and talk about AI apartheid, because in my desire to move forward on developing this clinical intervention, it became very clear that data was sorting us and pre-sorting us into social categories. And so the two things I want to leave folks with are that um, 
we've said it before, the concentration of ownership and of and control of data is fundamental to being able to be in a constitutional democracy. If we continue to allow our data to get away from us and we continue to allow our privacy commissioners to sit silently by while tech and data corporations and their lawyers chart the universe, we will find ourselves in the same place as we were in 1492. And we're in that moment where a new world order is being born and that we are not being active participants. And so I think it's important for us to think through what does it mean to not take sole ownership of our data because you fail to have scale and so you'll mm -hmm. not be viable. So right there as a business argument, that idea of commodifying yourself, enslaving yourself is dead in the water. And anyone who sells you that is selling you a bridge to nowhere. And also this piece around, we are a country that has had access to, in some ways, not all of us, universal health care from cradle to grave. And as Canadians and as Ontarians, we right now are being hunted for our data. We are a very desirable population. And we have to be very mindful as Black folks to fall for the trick when there is no treat. When we allow our race-based data to enter a system where we have already seen um, the carceral state, which is the state of prisons and polices and jails, take a hold of it. And Edmonton is an example. There is an entrepreneur that will now hold your data um, and combine it with every other piece of data to then surveil and decide what you do and can do. And that's happening. And we as people in Canada need to make it clear that it's not okay in Edmonton and it's not okay here. By the way, Edmonton, in his current interview just yesterday, as an example of modernizing policing. <laughs> it's called the apartheid state. Go ahead, Naomi. Um, I I would just I would just close with um with the message that this is th these next few months are really precious. Mm -hmm. Um because we, I think that there's almost a kind of a softness right now because things have changed so fast. Mm -hmm. um, and there is, when things change as fast as they have changed over, over the last few months, it, 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 it creates a terrain where it becomes possible to imagine other kinds of change. Um, and powerful forces within our governments, in the corporate world, want to close that window really fast, right? Um, before we act on what we have witnessed about how much money can be marshaled to, to, to address a health emergency. It, and we have health emergencies around the world um, that it is possible actually to put the need to protect one another above the need for profit. We saw that we were part of that. That's what we, that's what we were doing when we stayed home. Right. Um, and, and so in, in, in this period where things are still fluid, where they're still malleable, we need to be coming together um, and we need to be planning, organizing, strategizing, and proposing how we want to live, right? I think we should be thinking about these as the years of healing, right? We should be demanding massive hirings of community health corps, right? Um, to check in on each other. Contact tracing is not about an app, right? It's about saying, okay, what do you need to stay home? Can we help you take care of your kids? Um, you know, can we make sure that, that 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 your job is protected? It's about caring for our neighbors. It's about people who are rooted in communities with relationships doing that work. It is work that that can be created for young people who are seeing their futures disappeared right now. Right? Um, we can make sure that those jobs um, go to black and indigenous people first, to the people who were most impacted by this pandemic. That there's justice and reparation built in. These can be years where we repair relations with one another and with the land. Nobody has any idea how to restart, quote unquote, the economy. The whole thing is off the rails. 
It is crisis at every level. Anybody who pretends to know how to do this without a vaccine is lying. We don't know how to get the school started. We don't know how to have every time they op reopen a factory, there's another, you know, there, there's another outbreak, right? Um, so this is a moment where we can really propose and we have to be creative. We have to be bold. We have to, we have to center humanity and not technology, right? We have to center justice and repair. Um, I think that there's real possibility here. I, this is a incredibly painful moment and you certainly don't need me to tell you that. Um, but I think there is something moving about the fact that after months of isolation, people are leaving their homes, in many cases for the very first time to fight for justice, mm -hmm. not to go shopping, not to mm -hmm. go to the beach, to fight for justice and freedom and against white supremacy and police brutality and barbarism. Mm -hmm. And that, that's got to give us hope. <laughs> that's got to give us hope that people want something better. That is an incredible thing. It's happening right now as we speak. <laughs> All over the world. You're always, you're always trying to pull me out of my pessimism. I know I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really you good move be there. <laughs> we are at nine o'clock, and I want to thank our audience for staying with us. But I want to thank both you, Lana and Naomi, for taking us on this really wide-ranging conversation, deeply insightful fantastically educational about the stakes of big data, AI, machine learning, and and the world that we're going to have to make, yes, mm -hmm. as we see folks doing right now on the streets of the, U the US, here in Canada and across the world, Black diaspora people coming out to remake the world. And I think that these kinds of conversations are a part of that remaking. So thank you very, very much and have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. See you tomorrow. <laughs>